I've committed my career to education, so it may surprise you to know that I've always been a bad student. I started off okay. In elementary school, I was the kind of kid who would hurry to get his homework done in those gaps before recess and, and on the way home on the bus so that I could consolidate my time to spend on the kinds of things that, that I wanted to do. In, in middle school, I was the kid who would get in trouble for drawing when I was supposed to be paying attention. Um, and, and I was starting to discover that I didn't always agree with the ideas that the teacher had for my time and energy. In high school, I would be sitting in the back row of the class reading a novel when the teacher was lecturing, when I went to class at all. Often I would skip class and, you know, I wasn't a hopeless case. I, I might go to the library and, and learn about things I was interested in. Uh, I might just go to the river near my school and read or draw or write stories. Uh, now, just so, just so my kids understand, because I know they're going to watch this, not paying attention in school comes at a price. And when it, was, when it came uh, time for me to enter my senior year, I found that I didn't have enough credits to graduate. Thankfully, my parents had the idea to convince the school to let me take independent study courses from the university to make up the credits. Now, this was the early 90s, and the height of technology was audio cassettes and paper-based assignments, right? But, but I discovered that the media didn't really matter, that because I was able to learn at my own pace and at my own place, I could outpace the high school calendar, and learning actually became more enjoyable. And, and I actually did a better job at it, too. So, yay, I made it, right? And, and I went on to college, and, and about the time I entered in college, uh, there was this thing called the World Wide Web. And, and I, I had been uh, so compelled and impressed by that independent study experience that I immediately latched onto the idea that, hey, this internet, can help us learn differently. And, and I was right. Now, up until that time, I'd really thought about um, uh, online education in terms of you know, giving you access to all of these great resources anytime, any place, uh, and also for adding that flexibility of, of time and space. I didn't really think about the human interaction part of it uh, until one semester, uh, an English lit professor said, hey, we're gonna use this thing called the online bulletin board for discussions that are going to go on outside of class, you know, in, in between our regular sessions. And I know, online discussions, this is like old hat. This is one of the earliest forms of online education. So you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit as I walk through why uh, these are an important way to illustrate the flexibility of, of online tools for teaching. Let's start by thinking about the traditional face-to-face -face class. So you're a teacher and you have your class in front of you, you may ask them a question. As soon as you ask that question, the clock starts ticking. And it's a race with all the students in the class to see who can come up with an answer and quickly raise their hand. Now, you're gonna call on maybe one or two of them, whoever you may notice, right? And then they're going to have a chance to articulate their answer orally in front of their peers with what limited knowledge and resources are available to them at that time and space. You're not going to have time to call on everybody, which is probably just as well because not everybody is ready to respond and not everybody wants to respond. So let's compare that to the online discussion. In an online discussion, you might pose a question on Monday and give students until the following Monday to make their responses. Okay? So now students aren't racing against the clock. They have time to think about their response. They can refer to external resources, books, materials, websites, whatever. Okay? And they all have a chance to respond. So you can actually enforce that expectation that everybody participates. Because it's online, you as the teacher now have a way to measure both the quantity and the quality of their responses. And this is a good way for you to, to use that as another form of assessment of their understanding. And then finally, because it's online, it's preserved, and students can use those historic discussions to help them prepare for exams or write their papers, or really just to reflect on their learning at any point in the future. So I, I was sold, and then from grad school on, uh, I really de dedicated almost all of my energy to designing and developing online courses and programs. And so let's fast forward a decade. Uh, I'd been doing this at the university for quite some time. I myself had been teaching online for a number of years when my team was tasked with leading uh, a new blended teaching initiative where we would take part of a face-to-face -face class experience 
and replace it with online activities. I thought, this is great. I can get more faculty teaching online by easing them in through blended, right? And, and I thought, well, let me go first. Let me be the guinea pig and show you how it's done, right? Because we can take my online course and let's, let's take it back into the face-to-face -face classroom. This is going to be amazing, I thought. And it turned out to be a disaster because I had been teaching online for so long. I had been out of the face-to-face -face environment for so long. I didn't understand what to do with the time and the space. So I did what you know, was probably the worst thing imaginable. I took that existing online course and I built on top of it. And I started by replicating the materials that I had already created online in the classroom via lecture. So every single week in the face-to-face -face sessions, students would come in and they would hear the exact same stuff that they had already seen online. And I ended up doing what a lot of teachers do when they build a blended course, which is to create a course and a half. This didn't do much to help my reputation as a tough teacher, I can tell you. And, and because it was redundant, the students stopped attending class and their engagement started to dwindle. And I felt really bad about it. Now, the right way to go about doing a blended course is to first start by fully understanding the benefits and the limitations of both modes, online and face-to-face, -face, and to create your assessments and your activities aligned with those outcomes according to the different affordances of each. So I created some new in-class activities. We did peer critiques face-to-face -to, -face to help soften the blow. We did some, uh, some, some usability tests, some mock usability tests, so that students could actually see all of the actions of their classmates. And uh, you know, we did some hands-on problem solving that took advantage of real time. Now, today, technology continues to advance, and I think we're starting to see some of those limitations of online fade away. So for example, that same online discussion forum, okay, that same asynchronous discussion forum, can happen not just with text, but also with video. And it can happen in just a couple of clicks on your laptop or even on your phone. But the idea of blending online and face-to-face -face is still fascinating, in part because today we all live blended lives. When I wake up, my phone has been tracking my sleep patterns. I know, I'm kind of a nerd. But, you know, you guys probably all use an online calendar to help you get to physical appointments on time. And when I collaborate on a document with my colleagues, it's usually online, even if we're in the same room. When I go out to lunch with a friend, we use an app to help us find a restaurant, and so on and so forth. So when I'm teaching classes nowadays, my LMS will notify me when there are new assignments that I need to grade which helps me be more prompt in giving feedback, and, and I can give feedback using multimedia. So, so it's really interesting to think about um, how our lives are becoming increasingly blended. But it does make me wonder if perhaps, in the same way that I built a course and a half for my students, we might not be, be, be building a, a life and a half for ourselves. Because we, we have access to information all the time. We're, we're almost constantly connected. And because time now seems so easily managed, we think we can do it all. So how did we get this way? Well, let me, let me give you a little bit of perspective by um, sharing with you David Levy's ideas about the history of reading as they moved through th these three different stages, from intensive to extensive to hyperextensive. So the in intensive stage of reading uh, was, was when there were very few books, they were all made by hand, very few people knew how to read and had access to those books, and so they did read those books very intensely, very deeply, in a very narrow kind of uh, set of topics. Then the Gutenberg Press came, uh, reading materials were, were made more accessible to more people, uh, society's literacy rates improved, and the extensive stage of reading uh, lasted through the 20th century, right? And it gave us access to enough different kinds of reading materials and information that we could go fairly broad and fairly deep on any given topic. Then came the web, and the floodgates of information were opened up. Now, when we go looking for information, we can find just that one particular piece of information on the web that, that satisfies our need at any given moment. 
This is called the hyperextensive stage, where we move very broadly and rather shallowly from, uh, shallowly from one piece of information to the other. So this idea of hyperextensive reading uh, is, is backed up by evidence from usability studies that use eye tracking software to understand what you're looking at and what you're reading at any given point in time on the web. And these studies show that not only do people read very little online, but they move from one web page to another very rapidly. These habits are encapsulated in this term informivore, which is a way of describing our behavior online as we track down the scent of information. Now, this always has a cost-benefit decision associated with it as we get online and we go from one page to another, we click on one link or another. The benefit's going to be new information, more information, some sort of social reinforcement, some kind of uh, entertainment perhaps, but the cost is always going to be our time and energy. And I think Elliot was speaking ironically here when he said, there will be time, there will be time, because there's never enough time. And so we multitask. And it doesn't really work. Okay? It just puts us in this state of continuous partial attention. And the thing that's most painful to me is that it inhibits us from entering states of flow. These states of flow, which Csikszentmihalyi describes as those periods of concentrated attention where you are able to focus on the thing that you're really good at in a challenging way, and your sense of time and space warps, right? And you are in that moment, and not only are you on the path to mastery, but you're fulfilling your potential, and you're really fully enjoying life. So, this is my son. His name's Willem. He's 11. Uh, don't let the computer fool you. Willem is the poster child for flow states. In fact, in this picture, uh, he's building a computer game using the software Scratch. He, he does this every day for hours, literally hours every day. He gets so concentrated, his attention is so focused um, that he, he actually can't stand to be interrupted. Uh, he, he gets a little bit angry, even at the mildest distraction that might impede his progress in building his game. And I like that. I kind of want that for myself, right? Now, keep in mind, uh, Willem's not connected. He, he has access to the internet, but he doesn't really use it. He, he's not really interested in that. Uh, he doesn't have a phone of his own. Uh, and, you know, he's probably unusual in that respect. I don't mind, but I do worry that someday he's going to have to sacrifice his habits of focus and attention to the gods of constant connectivity, right? So what's a parent to do? Do we, do we give in? Do we make them unplug? Howard Rheingold says there's another way, okay? So recognizing that there's no turning back from the changing society, we, we really just have to adapt. We have to adapt our tools and we have to adapt our practices. And interestingly, this fascination or this challenge of, of attention and distraction uh, is not new. Thoreau talked about it, but you know, it, it may be exacerbated by the modern age. In fact. I, th I think we all would agree that it, it probably is. And there have been some good ideas already to help us out. For example, the isolator. Okay. Who wants one? I want one. Okay. But there's, there's no magic bullet, uh, nor is there a magic bullet-shaped helmet. And, and so while I believe that, that technology can help and we need to continually strive to create new tools to help us develop focus and to manage information, I think there's something else we have to do too. I think in the same way that I had to fully understand the benefits and limitations of online and face-to-face, -face, we have to also understand the benefits and limitations, the affordances of an intensive and hyper-extensive mode of learning. Okay. And just as I had to rebuild my blended course to reflect those affordances, we may have to rebuild all of our courses to reflect these. I think this is especially true in an era of lifelong learning because even if the classroom were an isolator, what happens when they leave? Ultimately, we need students to be completely independent. 
We need to help them gain the ability to learn and to create on their own, in their own places, without the teacher, without structure. We need them to be equally comfortable practicing hyperextensive or intensive modes of learning. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's really not an option to choose one or the other. We have to choose both. We have to be able to do so deliberately. We have to purposely not just blend, because that suggests a simple commingling of the two, but we have to very artfully remix the way that we learn every single day. That is all. Thank you. <laughs>